What up, guys? So today on the podcast, we have uh, Sean Patrick Flannery. Did I say that right? Patrick. Pla- I said Patrick. Sean Patrick Flannery. Um, it was trying to combine words there. And uh, before we jump into the podcast here in a second, I want to let you guys know, if you're watching it on YouTube, um, there were some technical difficulties. This uh, this seems to happen from time to time with us. Like when Eugene and I started doing this podcast together, what, almost three years ago now? Was it, like, it was 2018, wasn't it? I don't, uh, yeah, it was like, August. It'll be three yeah, years in August. So, so we first started doing this, like there have always been these random pop-ups. Um, and it's like, it's the strangest thing. Whenever we get someone we're like really stoked about, it'll be like the program that's been working perfectly decides to not work anymore, right? When we had Stitch on um, for one of the podcasts, the the, the program that we had been using for over and over again was working perfectly fine. And then literally he tested it that day. It was working. Two hours <laughs> later, it was not working. It was so stupid. And we had to do this. So again, the, the, the program that we were using kind of uh, fudged up a little bit. But we got it going. And uh, Eugene, he's a nice wizard. So if you're listening to the audio, you probably won't even notice a difference uh, at all. Maybe you will. I don't know. Hope but not. But we are resourceful. We made it work. Yeah, but but we had him. Uh, we wanted to bring him on the podcast. I watched that uh, his his new movie that he was um, that he basically as he'll talk more about it in a second. Um, Born a champion, and I loved it. It was like my favorite jujitsu movie. It was the first jujitsu movie where I walked away. It was like that was awesome because there were so many things. I watched it because I didn't want to watch it honestly at first because I was just like I don't want to see someone butcher jujitsu. But then like I knew Sean was a, a black belt, so I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll watch this. And then a buddy of mine who I respect a coach he said dude you got to watch it it literally like hits so many of the points that all of us in jiu-jitsu have experienced mm-hmm. or have heard about at some point and sure enough I watched it and there was so much about like my jiu-jitsu training and experiences in the early 2000s mid 2000s that was like right there in it so it was awesome I loved it and so I, I talked to him and wanted to have him on the podcast and talk about jiu-jitsu with him and uh, I feel like I could have just I don't know about you I feel like we could have just kept going yeah um, he's so he's so good it just just sharing his perspective and what what he his passion for jujitsu is real. Yeah, dude. like it, it really comes through. Yeah, you, when you listen to him, he talks. It's a, not a. He's not. He, he's a real deal dude. That's gonna get down in there. And he's gonna train with you. He's not gonna just sit there and watch and, and mm-hmm. pick and choose partners. He's gonna get in there and train. And uh, it was cool, man. His passion for jujitsu comes through in that movie and also in the podcast. I for mean, sure. he's fun. He's fun dude to talk to. So guys, with that said, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, big thanks to our sponsors that help make this podcast happen so that on every Monday or, you know, obviously if you're listening to it later, but every Monday is the episodes when we release. Every Monday, you guys get to listen to us jabber on about this stuff. Uh, sponsor is Charlotte's Web. That's our, our one of our first sponsors, I think. We started, you know, using their products and then we, you know, they contacted us. We contacted them and set up a deal and everything else. But uh, it's it's been interesting recently where more and more people are trying out their stuff and I've gotten more and more positive feedback Good. both from the students at the gym where I've got I think about half of our gym on it <laughs> it's not like I'm like I'm like dealing something I'm dealing out a um, more restful sleep and overall w- uh, sense of well-being um, the uh, <laughs> the uh, and then I've got a lot of messages from you guys on Instagram and from emails that you've been using uh, either the sleep gummy their tinctures or some of the rubs and stuff like that and you've had a lot of uh, benefits from them so again I'm glad that's the case because Again, it's one of those things where, you know, anytime someone becomes a, a, they enter our little sponsorship thing here where if we talk about them, I've used the products and I'm comfortable with sharing them with people. Otherwise, I don't want to do it because I don't want to, like I've talked about this numerous times, one of the the times where I really was bummed out was when I, uh, a black belt friend of mine where he was like a part of this MLM thing Mm -hmm. and you know, I was wondering, I was like, Hey dude, are, is this stuff really good? And until, instead of telling me, yeah, it was great. He was telling me about how much money he was making. Mm. And I was kind of bummed out because I'm fine with people making money, but I'm like, it's the trust, sure. you know? And I, if, whether you're my student listening to this or not, I consider you an extension of, you know, my gym where I wouldn't, I'm not going to push anything I don't believe in. Yeah. And so again, if you guys want to check out some of Charlotte's web stuff, take the, uh, take the challenge. I, I consider it like a month long thing. Just try it out. You know, that's for me a lot of times whenever I'm trying to incorporate a new habit, a routine, a supplement, whatever it might be. I always like to give things a fair shake for at least a month to see how, even like with techniques, I always try them out for a month before I, you know, say I'm going to move on or whatever. Mm. Um, but if you want to check out some of their stuff and save a little bit of money, you can go to their website at charlottesweb.com. Promo code is Chujitsu and save 15% on the order. 
Um, our other sponsor is Matt at Epic Roll. Matt's been a longtime sponsor for us. I appreciate him. And he's got a lot of cool jiu-jitsu gear. He's got a lot of t-shirts, well, everything from t-shirts to gis to shorts to no, uh, no gi gear and rash guards, the yeah. whole thing. So um, what I like about Matt's stuff primarily are the designs. He does them all himself. So these are his own designs. He cooks up and then comes out. I wish I had his creative talent. Yeah. You know, because like some of, them, some of them are like so simple, like – you know, but I wouldn't have the wherewithal to make it look that clean. Like yeah. the, the, Kim, the Kimura shirt, like it's simple. You know, it's just the definition of it. But I wouldn't have thought about making it the way that it is. Like if I tried to, it would just look awful, <laughs> you know. But again, he has really clean designs. I really like his products. And if you want to check his stuff out, you can go to epicrollbjj.com, promo code is jujitsu, and say 15% on the order. And what's he got coming up right now? He's I think he's got a couple like launches coming yeah, up. Yeah, he's got, uh, I think he's got a new bag, like a gear bag. Mm. He's got uh, the shorts. He's revamped the shorts. So he's got uh, the, the gray and then the black he's going to mm. have coming out. And they're like, they don't have like the Velcro. They're more like an elastic oh, okay. band. So we're like kind of more comfortable. Um, yeah, I'll be interested in it because I, I know that like I'll have to get try some of those out because I know that one of the big issues with some of the MMA shorts a lot of times is that Velcro. Yeah. It eventually wears out. Wears out or kind of the fits kind of. Mm-hmm. So these are going to, I think, are going to be great. Nice. Um, he's been testing them. He says he, he really likes them. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I think that's it. He's got, you know, a couple of t-shirts coming out, like he said, and, and constantly revamp and add new stuff. Yeah. So guys, if you want to check out his stuff and get some well-designed gear that's comfortable, that's affordable, it's not overpriced or anything, it's really solid, check out Matt at EpicRollBGJ.com. And then thanks to Manscaped for helping make this episode here. Th- this was the one that I was the most resistant towards. Manscaped. Manscaped. Because originally, because again, if you guys have noticed, like a lot of you guys like listen, we, I don't I do not do traditional reads necessarily. <laughs> we don't. Um, because I, I like to try the product. So if I actually have something to talk about, I actually talk about it, right? Um, and originally it was, you know, they were t- talking about the ball stuff. And I was like, man, like, I don't want to talk about my balls. You know, it's just not necessarily what I want to talk about on a podcast, you know, because I mean, hell, I, I know we have a lot of ladies. There's a, a, several ladies that message me every time you guys enjoy the podcast. You'll send me a message. I really enjoy your podcast. So you probably don't want to hear about a, a freaking 35 year old man talk about shaving his balls. Um, but to the guys out there, they're not bad ball trimmers. <laughs> let's, just, let's just call a spade a spade. Here. I, I mean, it, 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 literally, I, I use them for pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I use yeah. them for like they're they're and they're really handy. Like I went to a seminar down in Florida, yeah. and I kept them with me. Like you know, because again, I don't I, I use like a safety razor. Um, yeah. And so I don't like to necessarily travel with that thing, but that that trimmer I can just trim down like all the hair, and yeah. instead of having to shave, I can just trim it down to a, like a really low uh, stubble, and it's fine. And then you know, again, Jess, my girlfriend, she's the one that helps get all like the all the fuzz on my back. She's the one that trims that, and she likes it better. And so again, it's a really like comfortable trimmer, the uh, the lawn mower, and they've got a lot of other products. I'm a big fan of their cologne too. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been using that. That's it's been good. my that's been my go to cologne recently. Uh, it's got kind of a. It, I know colognes are so relative to people's smell and stuff, but it's a very clean smell. Um, it's not very. It's not florally or anything like that. It's very clean. Uh, so I like it. So again, if you want to check out some of their stuff, we've the package that we got. What was it? Perfect package uh, 3.0, and that's got the trimmer. It's got the toner for mm-hmm. the balls. Yeah. Uh, so there's like a lotion and there's like a spray. It actually, mm-hmm. smells pretty good too. And then um, I actually put the spray sometimes like just in my beard. Really? Like I'll, I'll just like spritz it and oh, like boy, because it, well, it's got like a, a nice. Uh, it's got like a. A kind of an earthy, manly smell. Uh, and so I like the smell of it. So I'll, I'll just like put a little bit of my beard just so I'm kind of like... Yeah, it smells it, good. Because like people like put beard oil in. Yeah, yeah. And I just like that. I was like, this stuff smells good. Yeah. You know, and it, and it, it, does, it does just fine. Yeah, I think that's it. And, I, you know, we're big fans of packaging. Like the packaging on it is really nice. It's well done. It's a nice unboxing mm-hmm. experience. So Yeah, I mean, and there's something to be said about that. Like you know, It is. It's like, like, it feels good. I was me. reading about like when Steve Jobs was creating the package for the, uh, the iPhone. Mm-hmm. Like if you open up an iPhone and you pull it open, you know how it sticks and it's yeah, very... Yeah. It, it's it's, it's very like it, it, there's something to it, yeah. right? Um, and he 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 was downright neurotic about making that package just so, you know. Um, but again, I loved, oh, I really like their stuff. Um, so again, even though they were the one that I was probably the most resistant mm. to, I actually uh, I'm a fan of the products now. And you can check them out at manscaped.com. Promo code is jujitsu20. That'll save you 20 percent on the order, and you get free shipping. Oh, yeah, so if you're thinking right. about checking out some of their stuff, it's a good deal. And then we've got a new sponsor today. You're like, I, I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, Chiru, Chiru, stop, <laughs> stop reading so much of the stuff. I'm, you know, whatever. I mean, and, and some of you guys have already fast forwarded, so you're not listening. But if you're listening, then you're still with me. Today, today's last sponsor, the last one on the list, 
is called Submission Nutrition. So Submission Nutrition is a guy who is, he's a jiu-jitsu practitioner, and his thing was he was trying to basically, you know, kind of scratch his own itch, right? Um, so he created a company so that uh, essentially he started making food for himself because he was going to competitions, he was getting hungry. And so he created a um, different batches of overnight oats, if you're not familiar with those. Basically, you take the oats, you put them into a container, and then you soak them overnight, um, which is, is a good process for oats anyway, as mm-hmm. it helps the uh, the way that it breaks down in your, your gut. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I remember when I was on, in, I had pictures on Instagram of me like soaking my oats and mm-hmm. people like soaking them. And back in the day, that's how people used to eat oats. They You'd soak them, and then you could either get them cold or you would cook them afterwards. Right. But you'd soak them so they would break down. If I'm correct, and I could be wrong about this, but there's a particular type of acid, um, you know, like there's different like phytic acid or something like that. There's some type of compound that's not necessarily great that is sort of broken down or something through the process of soaking. But Interesting. Again, I could be off about that. It's something I feel like I read. Um, but again, if you want to... Uh, going back to his stuff, he started creating this stuff and uh, created all these different sort of packages or different uh, blends of overnight oats. I went ahead and used them, so he sent us a couple of packages. I've got like four packages, and there's several different flavors, everything from, there's like chia seeds and all these like superfood type stuff in there. And uh, I used them, and when I was using them, I would use them as a, so throughout the day, I if, for the those of you who have, who have followed me, I eat like six meals a day, right? You know, roughly right now. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of food. And so one of those meals typically, like, you know, I'll, I'll, they're all pretty good sized meals or whatever, but sometimes if I'm interested in a pinch and I just need to eat something kind of quick, um, I have, because it comes with these little containers, yeah. and I put the stuff in the container, soak it, and then I can just throw it out. I can eat that, eat one a couple servings of that with a protein shake mm-hmm. to get the protein that I need from it, and I'm good. You know, that's, that's basically a nice meal that I can eat that in about an hour. I can work out, and my stomach doesn't feel very heavy. Right. Uh, for, so for some of you guys, if you work out in the morning or if, you just, if you're terrible with breakfast, that's kind of like, if I was going to get into this stuff, that's kind of where I would sort of think for it would be useful for people is for some of you guys that don't want to cook breakfast, you could take the overnight oats, have those ready, and then you could get some get a protein shake right afterwards. Bam! You got your protein, you got your um, complex carbohydrates, and there's a little bit of fat in it too. Off you go, yeah. right? Or if you just need like a little bit of food in between to before training or something like that, you could probably do it that well way as well. So uh, you can check them out. The website is submissionnutrition.com, and the promo code is chujitsu. Fifteen percent off. Fifteen percent off. Yep. All right, and uh, yeah, Henry, I got to talk to him a little bit. He's a cool, dude. Cool yeah. dude, and really passionate about it. Did a lot of his own research, his own testing, and, mm-hmm. and just kind of these are his kind of creations as well. He kind of made the flavors and all that stuff, and they're really good. And, and not have, for me personally, like I have to be really mindful about what I eat before I train. Yeah, you you're, you're, you got a sensitive stomach. Yeah, and so like this is something for me. Like if I'm between, like I can't. St- don't want to eat heavy, but I need something to give me some energy before training. Um, it's it's been a really really nice to to start using that. So awesome, awesome. And guys, if uh, and I always say this, if you want to check out and see what's going on in the, the inner workings of uh, the Chuster's mind, you can head on over to my website at chujitsu.net, and uh, I give away a couple free eBooks there, and you can sign up on my uh, email list. I send out a daily email. Uh, you can be a part of the Chew Crew if you'd like to. You can get the ebooks if you want to. They're free. And then you can unsubscribe if you want to, or you can just enjoy the content that comes through to you. And usually you'll be kind of, if you're if you're on that list, like when I have seminars and stuff coming up, you're going to be the first to know. Like we sold out on the seminar that I did in Florida yeah. like uh, last week, and most of that was from the people on the email list and everything else. That's cool. So, yeah. So th- those are the people that get the first kind of crack at anything that I have going on. So, um, but guys, with that said, let's jump into the podcast with Sean and let's Let's talk about some jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu. Love it. Can't get enough. It have to have it. All right. It was good talking to you guys, man. That's it? Uh, no, I got plenty of time, man. Cool. Good, good. Awesome. Um, yeah, man. Where, uh, where, are you, uh, where are you located right now? Just curious. Houston. Well, Houston. outside of Houston. I'm... Okay. Uh, there is no incorporated city, so it's Harris County, and there's just a, a zip code, but it's mm-hmm. northwest area outside of Houston. All right. Very good. Um, Hi, y'all. We're in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, Kentucky. Yeah. 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 So you guys in Texas, there actually no – no uh, everything's kind of back to normal, really, or was normal the whole time, I guess. Uh, yeah, kind of was the whole time. Uh, uh, 
I, uh, I mean, we, we never stopped training here. Uh, now, obviously, you know, our core group of guys are kind of every day together anyway. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, and you know, we don't have any people that are, you know, high frequency traveling or going to big events and coming back, but I, we never missed a day. What about y'all? We, we stopped at least, we stopped for about a month and then, um, initially, and then after sort of when everybody sort of was doing all the stuff out in the streets, like all the, the, you know, the protests and stuff like that, I was like, well, if they're cool with that, I was like, I'm going to get with my, like you said, I'm going to get with my buddies that I see all the time and we're going to train. So we got back and we just, we just, uh, blacked out the windows and we got to training. It's funny how logic kind of creeps in and. You know, <laughs> uh, sometimes. Yeah, well, I mean, if all that kind of shit's okay, uh, you know, I yeah, yeah, I feel, I feel exactly the same way, man. I, I, I just uh, when 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 you look out there, there, there's congregations depending on what your ideology is, yeah. and I, you know, the virus shouldn't give a shit, in a <laughs> right? Way, whether you're protesting or doing jujitsu, it's. Well, uh, I talked to a buddy of mine in the uh, the FBI, and I was like, "Hey, man," I was like. You know, because he's one of my one of my black belts, and I was like, "Hey, do you do you know anything that I don't know? Is there something I should know or whatever?" And I was asking him questions about it, and he said, "Well, he said when I see the prison and the homeless population being decimated, he's like, that's when I'm going to start to get really worried. But until those things happens, when you know those people that have less access to hygiene and all these other things, like when that happens, that's when I'll worry more." He's like, "Otherwise, like I'm going to keep doing my thing." So I was like, "Oh, fair enough." Yeah, you know, I, I mean, logic would would you follow that logic and you would think, you know, if you can find a, you know, a third third world country where they don't have access to premier medicine and, you know, their or or even hygiene, mm-hmm. whenever those numbers start going up, which oddly enough they're not, uh, you know, yeah. that that would be a a, a prime indicator. Would I haven't seen knock on wood, but like jujitsu gyms have generally been, you know, even just generally been fairly fairly healthy and I mean I've seen people like I've had a few friends that have like they've gotten it but yeah. again it's not like it's not just tore through the gym and you know mm-hmm. just tore through the ranks of people and I've right. talked to several people so yeah I, I think it for for a lot of us you know that, that have trained jiu-jitsu during that time was a kind of a tough time I think as far as like physical health mental health and everything and um, that's the longest break that I had taken I don't know. It's probably the longest break you've taken. You've trained for like close to 20 yeah. years. I've trained for about 12 to 13 years. And that was the longest, like, besides being injured, that was the longest time that I took off. So, uh, and I think not having access to normal things, like going out to see friends, family, things like that, not having that jujitsu aspect was very difficult. I think that's the main thing was. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, it's, it's the one variable that I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, some of these experts don't take into consideration, you know, it's, yeah. uh, th- th- there's a lot of things that come into play to make you healthy across the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, otherwise we'd stay hermetically sealed. You know, yeah. we would have no human contact. I mean, certainly you follow that logic, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, you sleep next to the river cause it sounds good. You move a little closer. It sounds even better. You move mm-hmm. even closer. So sooner or later you're sleeping in the fucking river, you know, <laughs> it's, it's uh, at the end of the day, yeah. how, how, how safe do you want to be? From this, what 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 is what is your risk to reward? Because my reward is peace of mind. I mean, like 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 I've told plenty of people, it's my sanctuary, it's my priestless church, mm-hmm. it's uh, it, it's my religion. You know, it's it's a big portion of my religion. I, I know of all those things that I can that I can do and I can recenter myself. It's that red map. Mine happens to be red. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, you guys agree with it. You take that away from me, and something's missing, man. It's uh. And, and, and I don't see the inverse. You know, we've never missed a day. And uh, we had, uh, I had one of my students uh, contract COVID, and he works at a hospital. Mm-hmm. And he had a headache for about four or five days, and he had a fever, and then it went away. And mm-hmm. I'm certainly not making fun of the, the, the virus. Uh, of course not. Certainly, I, 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 I certainly don't want to get it. I don't want anybody to get it. Yeah. But if we remain training and one person has, has gotten it and he's working at a hospital, I don't know those uh, those numbers. Just uh, they, they they don't parallel what I'm seeing on the news. They just they just don't. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's it's funny you were talking about that, like the the sanctuary. It's uh, last night I was um, we had like a a little training session for some of our white belts to sort of see where they're at and evaluate them. And it was interesting on the mat. Like we had a you know big group of them, 
And you, within that thing, I was talking to one of my assistant coaches who's been helping me a bunch, um, a guy who literally told me he came into the gym at, like the, the day after contemplating just being done with the whole thing and committing suicide. He's been with us for, you know, gosh, you know, almost getting close to six, seven years. We go in last night. I hear one guy, his, him and his, him and his old lady just broke up and he was like, I was either going to go drink it, drink myself stupid, or I'm going to come train. He's like, I feel better now. I talked to a guy who's a newer student who, you know, is driving nearly an hour cause he's saw the gym on the videos and stuff like that. And he's like talking to him. He's like, man, he goes, I thought about just being again, thought about suicide contemplating. He's going through a lot of rough stuff in his life and it's something that kind of helps center him and then kind of brings things back to kind of help with it. I even have like one of the guys that was helping with the test last night. Like he uh, was a guy who's a military veteran who was on all the uh, medication stuff like that to deal with the anxiety, PTSD, everything else. And through training, he was able to wean off of those medications. And so again, uh, like you said, it's, it, you, you know, when you look on the mat, we're doing something that seems like, ah, oh, we're just wrestling around. But to so many different people, it means something completely different. Each person in there is going through something because each one of us has our own little life that's going on, right? And each person is using that jiu-jitsu to deal with different things. And uh, you just never know. It seems it, like there's the, the surface level stuff that's going on. And then beneath the surface, there's all this stuff that everyone's dealing with. And it helps them do that. Yeah, you know, you know, every practitioner, every member of a real family academy has the same experience. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, you're, you're speaking a different language, trying to convince somebody else of what you're talking about. But you know, at 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 my academy in LA, I would have, you know, the head of of CAA agency, which is a huge talent agency, mm-hmm. sitting on the wall talking to a kid from East LA that I'm pretty certain has probably robbed a liquor store before and they're shooting the shit for 45 minutes. They both tried to strangle each other. They're in a puddle of sweat, ringing wet. One goes and puts on a $50,000 Rolex and one dude goes and puts on holy sneakers. And you know, it, it, it's that kind of connection, you know, cut to another person, you know, puts on their Facebook page, Hey, I'm changing apartments and I rented a U-Haul and the CAA head shows up and so does the East LA guy. Mm. And, and they're eating slices of pizza in the back of a U-Haul together. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, there is no other, there is no other collective that does that. You know, I've certainly been on film sets that if I put it on my Facebook page, Hey guys, I'm moving. Would somebody help me? Fucking no one would show. For <laughs> no your jujitsu Academy. I mean, a hundred percent of the people. Mm-hmm. And if not, they'll give you an excuse, brother, I would be there, but you know, it's my, my sister's wedding and I'm going to be here and they'll send you pictures just to confirm just so they don't think, Hey, I'm not, I'm not skating out, man. It's just a different type of tribe. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I think your voice is a little wasted on people that haven't experienced it because it's a, it's a, you know, I, I certainly don't want to equate it to something as heroic as the military, but it, it's the closest thing to that. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if a guy that you were in, the, in, in a trench with called you and asked you for a favor, you fucking show up. Mm-hmm. That's just what you do. Mm-hmm. And it's not too different. Than with a jujitsu academy, and I'm sure you guys have the same experience. Yeah. And when something like this happens, and they're like, "Oh, you know what, guys, you just need to take a year off." I mean, that 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 sounds wonderful on paper. Sure. Um, and I'm sure if everyone had a unique personal experience of knowing five people in their circle that this greatly affected, look, if if people are getting mowed down on the street, you don't have to convince people to go inside and take shelter. They're right. seeing. It. But if you tell them, hey, people are getting mowed down on the street and they keep driving down the boulevard and seeing nobody, eventually they're going to come out of their house and go, eh, guys, uh, I know I know you're telling me people are getting mowed down, but I just went to the mall and everybody's kind of doing their yeah. shopping. It's, you know, eventually it's uh, people are going to make up their own mind. And, and, and I, uh, I think that's kind of the place that we're at. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, everybody has their reality and it's it's. It's what, what our five known senses are experiencing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can tell me all day long, hey, if you two, take two steps forward, you're going to run into a brick wall. But, you know, it's like, do you believe your lying eyes? Eventually, mm-hmm. you open your eyes and you're like, there's no fucking wall up here. Yeah. I'm going to actually take a step forward or I'm going to do it with my hand out. Well, didn't touch anything. I didn't think there was anything. You take another step forward, didn't touch anything. Except, and you keep fucking walking. Eventually, you start to question these things. If you don't see things in your real life that substantiate the story that you're being told, yeah. and I'm certainly not making light of it, but I don't know five people who have died from it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't. I, I, I know two people that got a bad flu and they're okay now. 
you know, and, and, I, and I certainly, I wouldn't advise anybody to take a risk if they had pre-existing conditions or if they're morbidly obese. Obviously, we know now who this is affecting. Yeah. You know, there's virtually close to zero chance of, of anybody under 10 perishing from it. Uh, and there's a high probability that if you're over 80 and you're morbidly obese, you, you don't have a good shot. And, and those are those are understandable. I, I mean, th those realities are, are, are coming true. But uh, to take away something that I know is such a large part of everybody's well-being and saying, yeah, just put that on pause for a year. Actually, not a year until we say it's OK. Mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I don't know how people react to that. And you see it on social media. I mean, everybody I know is publicly. Yeah, we're closed. We're closed. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's you know, it's 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 crazy. It's it's a very odd time, man. And. Again, I you know I don't, I don't I don't take it lightly. I'm not making fun of it, but uh, I, I do know the medicinal value of jujitsu in every practitioner's life that I know, and and, and, that, and that's that, that's not an exaggeration. One hundred percent of the people agree with me that that red mat is their sanctuary. Mm -hmm. it, it is a large portion of their medicine chest, and if you deny that, you haven't spent time on a mat. You haven't. Now here's a question I have for you. How did you get started? Like, kind of take us back, like, because obviously you're you're passionate about it, just like we are. How did you get started in jujitsu? Man, I, you know, I've been a lifelong martial artist since I was nine years old, and I started in uh, in uh, my, my first experience was a McDojo, as is a lot of people's. Uh -huh. uh, it was in a strip mall next to a Piggly Wiggly. That's a southern <laughs> store, and uh, um. Long story short, I, 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 I competed in martial arts and, and been an avid practitioner and just hungry for information and different styles my entire life. And uh, everybody knows the, the Hicks and Gracie, the, the old garage story, where he had a, a, an academy on Pico Boulevard in L.A. And uh, he closed that down. He was going to open up a, a – a, a, he was going to move it a little bit uptown. And he was going to open up one on Wilshire and Barrington. And while he was doing that build out, he was renting space in the Pacific Palisades uh, from a karate instructor named Jerry Banks. Mm. And uh, Hickson came in, you know, they start hardwood floors, they're putting mats down. And I see that there's this patch that says R I C K S O N, and then the second name Gracie. Like every martial artist in 93, November the 11th, 1993, we know what happened, UFC won. I saw that and I thought, holy shit, I want to learn that crap. Because part of me is a little skeptic. You know, part of me, you know, you see it and you think, I don't know, man, this guy, I mean, he kind of threw a, a, a weird kick to the knee and then he drug him to the ground. It didn't even look like a judo throw or wrestling. He kind of drug him to the ground and then he had his arm somewhere near his neck and the guy tapped out. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that was real. I couldn't really see what was happening, but he ran through people, Hoist Gracie. And I knew I want to find out about this. You know, I, I did believe it, but I had a little healthy skepticism. But I wanted to experience it firsthand. And then when I saw this patch, I thought, is this, are you any relation to Hoist Gracie? He goes, yeah, my friend, you know, he's my brother. I was like, mm -hmm. what? What? You know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, asking uh, Derek Jordan or, or asking Michael Jordan, are you related to Derek Jordan? <gasps> no, Michael Jordan. He's like, uh, yeah, you know, he, uh, yeah, he's my brother. He's never picked up a basketball in his life. But yeah, he's my brother. Um, and, uh, and he threw me a gi and I trained that night. And uh, like everybody's story, yours, yours, it's, uh, there was a very, very brief warm up. Uh, Louis Heredia, Le Mans, who has an academy, uh, Hicks and Black Belt, who has an academy in Hawaii now. Uh, he was there. Uh, uh, one, of my, one of my instructors throughout my career, probably my main consistent instructor from page one to even now, Henry Akins was a brand new purple belt at the time. And his little brother was on the mat, Matt Akins, uh, who, you know, Henry's always been about a buck, 85, buck, 90, maybe 200 on a couple extra piece slices of cake month. His little brother's always been 135 pounds, just a smaller dude. And I saw, it, you know, I did a brief warm up, said, you know, okay, now pick a partner, same size, same shape. We're going to do some spa. And so I picked this guy. And I knew the belt system went white, blue, purple, brown, black. And I picked Matt because he was a smaller guy and he had a blue belt on. And I thought, 
if this tiny little dude can stalemate with me, it'll blow my mind. Mm. And everybody knows how the story ends. You know, we clapped hands. He was on my back choking me. He arm locked me. He wrist locked me. He camored me. He straight ankle locked me. He heel hooked me. Did everything. And I didn't have an answer for it. I had no concept of even how to begin defending. And being a lifelong athlete at, you know, I competed at the top level of a number of different sports, as I'm sure you guys have as well. There's two types of people in the world. There's a type of person that gives themselves a story as to why that wouldn't happen if you met them in a dark alley. And there's a type of person that says, no, 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 no. If that dude wanted to, God forbid, rape my wife, I would have to fucking sit there and watch it. Mm. And I don't know what I need to exchange to have that power over another living mortal, but I'll exchange it. I mean, the, 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 the clouds in the martial arts sky parted and the truth was exposed to me. I didn't have an answer for this. And I've trained, you know, Shotokan, Gojiru, Taekwondo, Judo, Muay Thai. I, and this guy would have taken my wallet every single time we ended up in a dark alley. And the dude was a blue belt. He was the first colored belt you get. And that's how I got started. It was it was trial by fire, but it but it was it was that thing that uh, I'm a lot older than you guys, but but we searched for when I was a kid. You know, everybody thought growing up, if you were in high school, oh that guy's a black belt, he can kick five guys' asses. You didn't even have to know what it was a black belt in. Mm -hmm. Everybody, there was just this this mythical creature, this black belt. Ah, you know, the guy could have been a black sash in Aikido uh, under a McDojo from. You know, next to the Piggly Wiggly like I started at. <laughs> no, but everybody feared, oh, he's a black belt. Little did we know, some freshman high school wrestler would ragdoll those, most of those black. We had no idea. Mm -hmm. But that's when the clouds parted, when I found this jujitsu. And I mean, I was doing triathlons at the time. I, I, I was in impeccable shape. And I thought I was going to have a heart attack afterwards. I was so inefficient with my levers and using strength where I should have been placing uh, elements of mechanical advantage, but I had no idea. I was completely gassed. I tapped out, I'm not kidding, in, in seven, eight minutes, 14 times. I didn't have an answer for it. And I've never been that comprehensively dominated and destroyed in anything in my life. When I say that, if you put a tennis racket in my hand and I, and I went against Andre Agassi, I would probably fare better than a good athlete going against a, a lighter weight blue belt. I mean, it, it, it was truly an awakening for him. It truly was. Did, did your other martial yeah. arts and then also your athletic ability going in, that kind of even more sealed the deal for you on, on how serious this was, how effective it was? Like if you were just some run of the mill, kind of out of shape person and you, you went into a martial arts gym and you got handled, you'd say, okay, well, they're in better shape than me. They're this, they're that. But because you were bigger, probably stronger, very athletic at the time, you know, young, you felt like this is this is for real. This is a skill thing, not a, not a strength thing, not a power thing. Well, that definitely solidifies the lesson. But I, I, re I really think a, a large portion is your upbringing. You know, my dad and my granddaddy taught me lessons of losing. You know, they taught me how to be a good loser. And pick and choose and find out, find where you're, locate your deficiencies and address them. You know, my, my, my dad, my granddaddy, two, two of, of my, obviously the closest to me, they're, they're my family, but they were my idols growing up. Uh, my granddaddy could probably not grammatically punctuate a sentence to save his life, but some of the most profound insights came from that man. I mean, he told me every time, you know, there, there, there's two types of people in the world. The people that end up being champions are the ones that embrace failure. There's the people, there's two types of champions. There's people that love winning. And there's people that hate losing. I happen to be this. I hate losing. But when I do, I will go to that treasure trove and I will find out the fuck why. You won't find a ton of trophies on my trophy shelf. I mean, I, I, I enjoy those. But in, in what garage sales and whatnot, my, my wife has even said, I wish you wish have kept that. And I probably should have for my kids. But really, my disdain of losing has driven me and forced me to look at those losses and find out why. Look at that problem and address why. Otherwise, if I got all my pleasure from winning, I would just go, well, I'm, not, I'm just not going to go to that area anymore. I just won't compete in jiu-jitsu. I won't have to address it. But I was like, there's a problem there, and that's going to exist in my life. I need to figure out the answer to that conundrum, which it was. And so that day, 
I signed up for two classes a week and that lasted one fucking class. And I changed that shit to unlimited. <laughs> I was completely blown away and addicted. And when I say for the first three or four years, I probably, and this is not an exaggeration, I probably spent averaging three hours a day at that academy. That is no joke. So, <laughs> so man, I wanted to ask you something because you were talking about how you got started in, in martial arts. You were talking about Hickson, um, you know, being in this karate gym. And I had a similar experience with one of my coaches where there was a point where, um, because originally we started off in like a, a powerhouse gym in like a room in the back. And then it was in a, we graduated into like a Taekwondo slash like, you know, another martial art gym that we were training at. And there was always this friction that was existing, right? Because because it's like they shared space because they were, were okay with the money, but at the same time, you know, there was always this un, this 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 friction that you could tell between the two, and that was something that was in the movie that I was like, oh, dude, that 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 happened. Like we had that happen before, where the Taekwondo coaches were like, um, uh, that stuff doesn't work, and literally it was like a showdown with like the the, the Taekwondo coach's son and then two coaches for us. So back then, was there ever like a situation like that you ran into? I don't know with Hickson at, at that gym or a gym that you were involved with, where you know you're sharing space, and then eventually there's kind of that conflict there. You know, n n never with sharing space, but I mean, as you guys all know, especially way back in in the jujitsu days, th th there was all kind of challenge matches. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, I, I, don't, I don't say this to sound like some badass, because the truth be told, you know, the first one of those that happened, you know, some some guy came in at uh, at Hickson's, and I was doing a private. So there was the class, there was an hour open mat, and then afterwards a guy came in and, and to be honest, I, 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 I was scared shitless to be the first, it was, you know, the Gracie challenges, God forbid, what, what, what happens if I lose? I, 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 I figured I, I got a day job. I, I don't, it's not really making sense to me. And scared shitless, not scared at all to be injured at all. I've been in plenty of fights growing up in Texas, man. For the first time, I had a real adrenaline, never had a real adrenaline dump in a fight, it, 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 really, to that magnitude of, but outside of like, oh shit, this guy, if he wins, this would be a, a, a it, it, it just takes on a completely different, you know, level, level of importance, and it's, it's horrific, you know, it's, but that happened all the time, man, even, even it's, uh, at, uh, at Hollywood Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right there on Santa, on La Cienega and Santa Monica Boulevard, you know we had a couple of guys come come in. Uh, one of my one of my uh, black belts, uh, Steve Cardenas, who also happens to be the Red Power Ranger. Um, mm, yeah, he's a he's a, a, a black belt in uh, uh, Kempo Karate, and uh, and also a long time Jiu-Jitsu practitioner. I think he got his black belt five years ago. So he's a uh, Line. Very good. Very good. He was a brown belt and he was teaching my kids program and a, and a kid come in, came in and he, and he ended up breaking his shoulder with a, a standing self-defense Kimura. Mm. Called the, the sheriff's department. They had to come in. They removed the guy on a stretcher. And that's not a, being a bad a guy, just a lunatic, wanted to come in during the kids class. Steve said, you know, you got to leave right now. You want to come back and we can discuss anything that you want. Uh, but the guy came into the academy first with me. And I thought he was going to sign up for classes because he came in and I said, hey, how can I help you, man? He goes, well, you know, I want to fight. And I thought he meant I want to be an MMA fighter. So mm -hmm. I'm coming here for some jujitsu training. And we also did wrestling and Muay Thai. I'm like, OK, cool. Uh, you know, what's your prefix experience, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, I've had one one uh, professional fight. And he did. We looked him up on Share Dog Fight Finder. And the, the, the guy was a loose screw, though. I, I still have photos on my phone because Steve took of the sheriff removing him from the academy with a broken shoulder. Anyway, the, the guy was a, a, a wing nut. I, I put him on the mat. One of my purple belts, Andy Donovan, I said, uh, uh, you know, pair up with Andy. He'll walk you through any details any, that you're missing, whatnot. Came time to spar and the guy went to the bathroom and Andy came up to me because I was doing business at the desk and he goes, man, the guy's in the bathroom. So I went, went to the wash. About 10 minutes later, he still hadn't come out. I went back and I knocked him I said, hey, brother, you, you okay? He's like, yeah, 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 yo, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to come out in just a minute. And it just his voice was really weird. Like, what do you – I don't know if you're – we hadn't even done anything 
cardiovascularly taxing. Anyway, he finally came out, and he came out like with his clothes on, you know, and he, and he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll come back next time. I got to – weird, left. Next time he came back, it was with Steve. Steve was doing the kids' class. And he came into Steve, and he goes, you know, I want to I wanna, I wanna fight. And Steve was like, what, what do you mean you want to fight? He's like, right now, I want to fight. So Steve was like, look, we're not going to do this. you got to get out in front of parents. Mm-hmm. So anyway, class ends. There's still like two parents left, and the guy comes back. And came onto the mat, came right into the door, and I won't get into too many details for liability. But anyway, one one thing happened. If you you would have thought, you know, Steve Steve stopped when the guy asked. Steve went behind the desk, said, "You got to leave." The guy came running behind the desk. Steve is on the phone with the sheriff's department when the guy comes up. Steve grabs him, standing come or turns, puts him on the ground. And cracks his shoulder. I mean, mm-hmm. the guy attacked Steve behind sure. the desk. It was, I, I mean, it, it, so things like that are, are they're, they're, they're not rare. You, you would have thought by this point, everybody has seen Gracie's in action. You would have thought everybody has seen, but still, especially as you know, if you've been training 20 years, people come in all the time. And a lot of times it's not for a fight. And I've had plenty of these where people don't want to fight but they really want to see if this works. Yeah. So, the, you know, there's varying degrees of the challenge matches. I'm, I'm sure you know. Sometimes guys are like, oh, no, 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 we're throwing. And then other times guys are like, no, 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 I don't want to throw punches. But, I, but I, you know, I think I could probably defend against, well, I'm going to do everything. But, you know, I mean, is it okay if I smack you, if I can? Yeah, okay. There's very, and then guys that don't want any punches at all. Mm-hmm. But they still want to see if your jujitsu can work. Like everybody thinks challenge matches, they're coming in and they're, you know, throwing knees and, and don't get me wrong, sometimes that is the way it is. But I've found in my experience, the majority of the time, they they, they, they they don't want anybody to get injured. They just are hungry for the truth. And they truly believe, I can stuff your clinch, prevent your clinch, I can stuff your takedown, and even when it gets on the ground, I can defend against the submission. Mm-hmm. And then the second time, they'll ask, well, Okay, well, if you get close, can I can I open palm, open palm, and then yeah, okay, and then if they want a third time, well, like you know, I mean, I think you know, I, I could have, and then that's when you say, okay, but I have to amp it up a little more as well mm-hmm. for them to find that truth. But it's not always an angry, I'm throwing for the KO fences, you know. As a matter of fact, in my experience, those have been rare. It's been martial artists that 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 truly believe that they can hook kick you from a distance and KO you before you close the distance clinch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And and nine times out of 10, I I, I, got to say they're, 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 they're they're, they're humbled and they understand. And the majority of the time, if they don't sign up that day, they're going to go home and they're going to think about it and they're going to come back and they're going to say, just like what I put in the script, I can't wrap my head around it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. And I was in that category, and I found that the majority of other people that first tried jujitsu are in that category. Oh, man, I was in that category. I wrestled, and then me and my buddy pieced together some, like, my wrestling buddies, we pieced together some moves that we, we saw. YouTube wasn't around back then, so we were just kind of, like, watching grainy matches that we could find online of rolling in uh, MMA fights. And I remember talking to my my coach on the old AOL Instant Messenger, and I told him, I was like, you know, man, I think I'll probably be around blue belt level, you know? <laughs> and I went in there, and I got smoked by everyone. I remember the smallest dude in the class uh, put me in a Nogi Ezekiel. I was down there, and I, I remember seeing the can opener, because that's all the wrestlers were doing the can opener back yeah. in the early 2000s. So I was there, like, can opener his neck. He, like, pummeled his arms through and just did a Nogi Ezekiel choke. And I mean, I got my butt whooped by everyone. And I remember afterwards, I went home and I, I, like you said, I was like, I've got to know this. I've got to know this stuff because I couldn't do anything to anyone and I thought I could. And the guys that had been training for like five, six months who had like no prior wrestling experience were like, I could take them down, but then they would just submit me as soon as I got to the ground. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it pains me to say, but I honestly felt like I would be at purple belt level. Mm-hmm. I thought... You know, it, it'll take an upper purple belt to catch me in something because my experience, you know, when you first sign up for Taekwondo, you get a, a, a yellow belt in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, yeah. <laughs> a, a division one, not even grappler. You take a D1 strong safety from University of Kentucky and you put them against the same size, same weight, yellow belt in Taekwondo, you give me the strong safety all day long. Mm-hmm. 
just on pure athleticism and being understanding how the body works. Hell, you take the next, you take an orange belt, a green belt. But man, the first belt in jujitsu, I don't give a shit. If you don't have any grappling experience and you're the same size, same weight, I don't give a shit. If you're an NFL pro, if you don't have grappling experience and he's a blue belt, you're going to lose all your material possessions. And, and, it, and it's, it, that's a, a horrible thing to have to acknowledge. But that's not, that's not a vacuum that I want to walk around with in my life. I need to fill that shit. Me as a person. I just need to fill so it. Like with you training you know, frequently every day, three hours a day, and uh, were you still acting? How are you balancing your life kind of outside of jujitsu with jujitsu and still you know, keeping everything in line and doing well? Uh, the truth is I wasn't like anything else in my life. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, when you're young, you know, you, 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 you chase money and a lot of ex, extraneous things can bypass money in a lot of ways. You know, the age old adage, you know, you're never going to, never going to lose chicks chasing money, but you'll lose money chasing chicks. It's kind of, <laughs> that's the kind of age old adage that, uh, you know, my granddaddy kind of, threw out at me, but it, it, it's a little bit no different, but, uh, you know, I, I became obsessed with jujitsu and I made what most people would consider shitty business decisions because of jujitsu. And of course it, it, I can certainly say that. I mean, I, 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 I turned down films that I probably shouldn't have, but well, if, if, if my ultimate goal was solely on acting, but I truly loved this martial art. For example, I took, I took six months off just because I wanted to train for the Pan Ams and I wanted to compete in the Pan Ams. I mean, the first time, you know, Shane Rice, who I think was a, a Hicks and Purple belt at the time, you know, he, he told me, he's like, man, Pan Ams, you know, they're coming. This is the one that you want to win. And I thought, I, 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 he showed me the medal. I said, I want to get a gold medal at that. That's what I want to do. And so I turned things down. And should I have done that? Absolutely not. Do I regret it? Not a fucking blink do I regret it. What jujitsu has given me, I tell people this all the time. If you take, and I'll, I'm in my office. Uh, I, I've been doing this more than 20 years. So obviously this, this is retired now, but you can see how old and beat up it is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even wear this anymore. Stinks like shit. It's never been washed. This is in my office now. So what, what that, that, the information, the relationships, all the, the character traits that that has given me, to me, is far more valuable than 95% of the things that I've got from each individual film. You could pluck a film out of my IMDb list. IMDb is a website where it tells you exactly what films people have done. Mm -hmm. And there's things that I would give back. And I, and I don't say that uh, brashly. It, it's the truth. There's nothing in this that I would give back. Nothing. My, my first Pan Am experience wouldn't trade for the fucking world. Even if I go back and I go, well, this is something that they offered you that you turned down. And, and maybe that was pretty big. Maybe that would have done great things for my professional career. Even to this day in hindsight, I wouldn't fucking trade it for those experiences. Wouldn't trade it for the world. And, and monetarily, they're incomparable. Incomparable. I mean, financially, what I've gotten from jujitsu pales in comparison to the shittiest film that I've ever done that I pray the world never sees. Incomparable. But as far as making me whole and giving me something that I can leave behind to my kids, it's in that, man. It's in that. And I wouldn't trade it for the fucking world. Is there anything you would have done different in jujitsu? Like anything as far as like your training, uh, your time on the mats, or anything you feel like you maybe could have done different or done better? Man, absolutely. I mean, coming up through the ranks, it's like, uh, Chu, I'm sure you'll, 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 you understand. It's like when you start, and I tell all my students this, you're going you're gonna to learn like this. You're going to go, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. Once you get good, you're going to be like, Matt, don't need that, don't need that, don't need that, mm -hmm. don't need that, don't need that. This is what I need. And that goes, it, it was the same with me. You know, I would, I, I, now the way that I teach, I tell my students what they're going to see on YouTube. And why we don't do that. I don't wait for them to see it and come in and go, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you said we do this from side control, but they're saying that you can, they can attack you with this if you're in side control. So I preface it. I say, this is what we're going to do in side control when we do our escape. We're going to place our hands here. You're going to see on the internet 
how somebody can counter with this. Here's why they can't counter. So I preload them with all the negative that they're going to see. I don't want anybody to, to think I'm making up an excuse after the fact. I tell you what you're going to see and why we subscribe to this philosophy behind our game. And I wish somebody would have taught me that way, you know, because, uh, because I come from very old school roots, you know, Hicks and Gracie old school roots where everything takes into consideration blunt force trauma. There's not one position in his curriculum that doesn't take into consideration. Can you get hit from here? Can you get bit from here? Can you get your hair pulled from here? Are you mitigating danger? Are you managing the distance? And so when you see, when they don't explain, you know, the if, what, the where, and the why, and how the flow chart can, can come to play, Sometimes if you see something, you're like, oh, my God, I, nobody's ever shown that to me. Why can't I just do this? Lo and behold, you, you come to find out, well, yeah, you can get your dome kicked in from there. That's why nobody tells you. So absolutely. I was, I was exactly like some of the young students today. I was hungry. When somebody said, yeah, you can take that lapel, you can insert it up their rectum, pull it out their mouth, double loop it around their neck, wrap it around your pinky, and then you can tilt them over. You can tilt them <laughs> over. Well, now I go, oh. Okay, yeah, that's 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 you know jumping over seven fences to get back in my own backyard. I, I, I you know, uh, but I understand that the new students are going to be hungry for that. Mm. They're going to go on YouTube and they're going to see that guy that starts on the back, leaves the back, does a reverse X sweep, and then returns to the back. And they're like, oh my god, I saw this great back entry. It's like, no, dude, you saw somebody abandon the back to retake the back. That's what you saw. Mm. But the new student just sees, oh, man, my I can one, you know. So yes, I, I was on the receiving end of that. And that's one of the reasons that I coach the way that I do now. I, I tell you beforehand, what's going to, what's going to be that attractive thing out there. It's like telling your son when he grows up, Hey, you're going to see this and that's going to seem incredibly appealing. This is the road that that can take you down, you know, so that they see in advance. So nothing is shocking. You know, I want everybody to see, you know, that, 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 that I'm well aware that those options are out there. Here's why we don't do it. Yeah, it's funny. I the um, you know with the nature of what I do with like the videos and stuff, I'm a pretty basic person, like basic you know sort of forward person, just because my my game's just always been that way. Um, because when I first started, everything was based upon like fighting and stuff like that, and I just never really got into the really more I, I don't want to say complicated or whatever stuff, but the flippy turny end up around whatever stuff. And I remember I was at a tournament and I had a guy come up to me. And I just won, you know, double gold at the competition. And I did so primarily with basic takedowns. And like when I was passing the guard, I was doing like double under stack passes, um, basic jujitsu, just edit, you know, you just, the details are good. And uh, I remember he, he came up to me as a brown belt and he said, Hey, Chewy, man, like, uh, I love the YouTube channel, all that stuff, but uh, could you show some stuff that's more advanced sometimes for guys like me? <laughs> And I remember I was sitting there eating my acai bowl, you know, like sitting there eating. And I remember looking at him like, I was like, did you just see me roll? I did a double underpass. I did like a really basic thing, you know? And so I, I think you're right. Like when you were saying that, I'm like, that's, that's about right. Where you early on, you're like searching for this thing that like is going to somehow give you the advantage, whatever. And then once you start to get all this information, you start to whittle it down to like, what's effective, what's useful. You know, like you said, I don't need this. I need this. And like, you find this really sharp game that's full of details that maybe isn't the most fancy looking thing, but it's effective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, like, like I've said before, you know, one of my primary instructors probably throughout my career, the, 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 the biggest imprint is, is Henry Akins. And, you know, if you, you look on the internet nowadays, people are going, well, well, when's the last time that dude competed? Well, hey, I can tell you when the last time he competed. It was 2003 Pan Ams he, as a brown belt. That's when he competed. I was there. Um, and he hadn't really competed since then. I've rolled with that dude countless times. You pick a city. Every time I travel, I travel with my gi and my belt. In any city, you're going to find somebody that's rolled with me. I'm here to tell you that Henry can scissor sweep my ass from the closed guard with hmm. fundamental crap. It's, it's, it, 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 it's like the Bruce Lee quote. You know, are you afraid of a dude that knows 10,000 kicks? Are you afraid of the dude that knows one kick, but he's practiced it 10,000 times? Well, that's the fundamental game. You know, you, you have a, your investment in jujitsu is finite. You have a finite amount of time to choose what I'm gonna invest my reps in. You can either invest that all in 20 things 
or 200 things. Mm. I promise if you're the 200 choice, you're going to be a jack of all trades and master of none. I promise you, I'm deadly afraid of that dude that's done a double under stack pass for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He's going to pass you. It's going to hurt like fuck. And you're not going to be able to get a lung full of air. <laughs> you're not going to be phoning out for pizza while a guy's passing your guard. You're going <laughs> to, it's a very, very different game. But I, I have the same experience when a guy says, well, show me the fancy stuff. It's like, well, dude, you just got double under stack pass in a tournament. Mm -hmm. Well, how much more? How much more? The fancy comes in your level of mastery. The fancy doesn't come in the dynamic nature or the complexity. The fancy is your level of mastery. And that's it. You know, how many guys are on your map? You know, if you teach something fundamental, like a, a, an up and over sweep is what we call it, or the hip bump sweep, sure. and you rep it, and then you see some of your dudes standing around, you're like, you good? They're like, oh, yeah, I got it. You're like, really? You got it? Mm. Get the fuck off my map if you got it, because I don't even have it yet. Yeah. And I hit it at the highest level. You're, you, you're, you're a white belt, and you're done repping it? <laughs> Go. I mean, those are the things that you're going to use at the highest level. It if you choose to reach that level of mastery, but as, but in essence, a lot of guys, they want to do it five times and then go on to the other variation or the other highly dynamic, highly complex things that may catch somebody unaware, but because they're not founded in solid structural principles, they can't be replicated against somebody's will. I find that the fancy stuff relies on speed and surprise. A lot of times the fundamentals solely rely on whose level of mastery is higher. If you have a higher level of mastery at their level of defense, you're going to pull it off. So it's a mathematical equation. There is nothing left up to chance. I can say I'm going to work on these three fundamental sweeps from the close guard, but I'm going to get so damn good at them that I don't care how well they defend. My level of mastery is going to be higher than their level of defense. And I truly believe that the cyclical nature of jujitsu is going to come back to that. Mark my words. In another year or two, somebody's going to have discovered this shit called closed guard. Mm -hmm. It's this weird thing where you actually, you, 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 you keep your legs crossed. It's, it's very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it, it's funny, like, because there's so much. There's so much stuff out there now. When you started training, even when I did like 12 years ago, there wasn't all these YouTube videos. There weren't all these instructionals. There wasn't as much information out there. And, um, you know, you kind of learn what you did from seminars, from tournaments, you know, your coaches going to cross training a little bit. But now it's just there's so much. You get sent so much different stuff from so many people. As, as, a, as a younger belt, it's very hard to uh, kind of process all that, I think, and then have a direction, like you said. So like you see the guys like Hodger Gracie, you know, closed guard, we talk about closed guard, very efficient, very effective from closed guard. One of the best maybe ever, you know, and, and a lot of these high level level guys are doing basic stuff. They're just doing it at such a, you know, impeccable way that it's just, it's hard to stop and stuff you've well, seen. Yeah. You, you look at Hodger Gracie. Hodger Gracie came out of a five-year retirement and used a series of things that are taught on day one yeah. to beat the top ranked competitor in his weight division decisively. And he did everything that you, you learn on day one. Now, look, I, I'm not some guy. I, I, as a matter of fact, I hate people that are like, yeah, but you know, my shit's for the streets. It's like, I, I hate that as well. So I, I, I certainly don't mean to come off like that, but it really depends on your mission statement. Okay. If your mission statement is to win IBJJF tournaments, then you should look at highly complex detailed sweeps that involve four limbs. Now, the only time you're going to use four limbs is when blunt force trauma is illegal. But if that's your mission statement and you don't care about punches, Absolutely. If you're on your back, you better be using two legs and two arms to affect Kazushi, completely disregarding blunt force trauma to vitals. That's the best option. But if your mission statement is self-defense, you better be limiting your sweeping limbs to two and have things that are defensive. And those are two completely different worlds. So should you choose one, there is a, a right roadmap to achieve that. If you should choose the other, there is an equally correct roadmap to achieve that. But they're very different mission statements. And I don't, I don't fault anybody for wanting to, I mean, I have 
I have people that go on the website and they su submit an inquiry and I say, you know, what is your objective with, with, with jujitsu? And they say, well, r really, I want to do tournaments. And I'll rightfully tell them this is really not the, the, the academy for you. You would be better served learning a very different style of jujitsu. You would be underserved learning this old school so style where I'm going to only give you use of two limbs to sweep. I'm going to assign two limbs to a very, very different thing that's illegal in IBJJF tournaments. That's not going to that's not going to offend you well in an IBJJF tournament. But that's not that's not where my heart is. And, and I don't disparage anybody for wanting to learn sport jujitsu at all. It's just not where my heart is. And the stylistic stylistic differences, there is a chasm of separation between the two. Well, and that kind of goes back to what you were talking about, even in your personal life with, you know, career, jujitsu, you know, money versus like your own like soul desires and everything else that you want, right? Like you got to kind of know what it is you want and move in that direction. Because again, that's where you want to go. And again, not necessarily criticizing other people and their decisions, but saying, here's where I'm going, right? So here's a question for you, because I, you know, uh, we we've talked about your jitsu and stuff. I want to know where the movie idea came from. Um, because for me, man, like I was so pumped up after watching it. I, cause there's been several movies that have included jujitsu and for the most part, they've all sucked. Like it's been like, <laughs> like they've had, they've had bits and pieces that were okay. And then it would take these weird turns. Like, you know, there was the one, like everybody's told me about red belt, but then it, at the end of red belt, like they're like, I, I, I don't know. Cause I've never watched all the way through, but I, I remember flipping it. it through and it was like the end. They're like, the guy has to fight with his hand behind his back and stuff. It's very strange, but like the, um, the movie that was awesome. And, um, even my girlfriend, she's a, you know, she's a white belt or whatever. She trains a little bit here and there. And like, I mean, she balled like, like two or three times during the movie and she, she had a blast watching it. Um, where did the idea for the movie come about? In my bed in 2007, um, I was actually on, uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the MMA underground. Oh Yeah. Um, I was on that forum and people were talking about, you know, uh, give me your best, uh, best story, write your best short story. And so I wanted to put something down and I wrote a short story and I, I didn't publish it because I, I sent it the next day to a, a producer buddy of mine, Paul Alessi. And I said, man, I think this is going to be, this would be a great film. And, uh, it was essentially what you see on the screen right now, mm -hmm. almost down to the syllable. Um, but that gives you an idea of, you know, the gestation process in the film business. It's, uh, you know, it's, you're, you're talking, uh, you know, 13 years because we shot that in the summer of 19. So this coming July will be two years. That tells you about, A, the gestation process to get something funded and actually shot. And then it tells you about the, the post-production process of even after you film it, how long for it to reach screens and cinemas. But it's... Uh, you know, you, 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 you write from your heart and what's important to you. And I actually moved out to LA to be a writer, believe it or not. Uh, I left university and I wrote a piece of children's theater and I wanted to drive out to LA and see if I could produce this play. I was doing theater at the time at University of St. Thomas and without sounding arrogant, I thought I was a good actor, but the mm -hmm. proposition of going and making a living in Hollywood, I didn't have any, there was no nepotism. I didn't have any friends or family in the business. I just thought, man, that's a, I don't, that's too long of a shot, even though I thought I was good, but I knew I could write. So I went out there to write and the process, an agent said, Hey, let me submit you on some commercials. And I thought, yeah, if it supplements my writing, what the hell got a string of national commercials. I was waiting tables at the time. Then she goes, you know what? Let me submit you on some theatrical, which means TV and film. I said, what the hell? If it supplements the next thing I know, I was a full-time actor mm. and, uh, and, and writing took a backseat. And then in 2016, I released my first book because writing was always at my core. And uh, the book came out and, and people it came out to big hearts and people loved it. And that's when I started pushing to get uh, to re, re, uh, re engage with trying to get the film made. And uh, then we shot it in 2019. And it's, uh, it's all the elements that uh, I find important you know, for my kid to one day see and to really represent my, like I said, it, it, it's my love story to jujitsu. It truly is. Jujitsu is more responsible for who I ended up being as a person than the acting industry by a factor of 50. I don't know. It, it just is. Um, it's where my heart lies. It's, uh, it's where my passion is. I was on the mat the first half of today. 
Um, that's why I'm sweaty and unshowered. And it's, 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 I'm sure you are. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys are in a studio today. I'm sure either prior to this or after this, you're going to be on a map. It's just who you are. It's uh, and so that's what I wrote about. And, and, and obviously it means so much. I, you know, I put my boys in it. My, my, the, the, the two kids, the two boys that play the Leeds son at six years old and then at nine, those are my sons. Yeah. And they both, they, they couldn't tell you when they started jujitsu. They've just always done it. Like if you ask them, they have to ask me, Daddy, when did I? I don't they don't know. Since diapers, you know. But I know because of what it's done to my life, I wanted to do the same thing to theirs. As far as the the fight scenes go, there's there's always we've watched a lot of these these movies, martial arts movies. You know, and Chewie and I were talking before the podcast about the the jujitsu is like the cleanest kind of purest jujitsu, like close to jujitsu that you would see on the mats. And how did you balance making it appealing to people visually, like, you know, maybe that don't even know jujitsu and also make it true to the actual art itself, to the actual martial art. How was that for you in, in making those fight scenes? Well, you know, I mean, the, 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 the old adage, you know, in Hollywood, when you sell a script, you know, it, it can be a script about the Vatican and some producers going to go, we love the story, but can it take place on Honolulu? And can they be in mohair thongs? <laughs> and you're going to be like, uh, actually, no, it's about the Vatican. Can't. Um, so yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, I had people that were saying, you know, we noticed that there's no kicks in this. We really feel like there should be some spinning kicks. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah there's, uh, yeah, there's not going to be any spinning kicks. In this. It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and it, and it took a little bit of, educating people i don't expect them to know you know especially when you're choreographing things without flying barambolos without any any connie basami takedown to inside heel hook reverse the far side like you know I, it, it it you could make this so dynamic but it's not the jujitsu that i love nor is it applicable to the time period i mean this was mid-90s jujitsu yeah. When it was heavy pressure, top game, or close guard. You know, so when, when I first started training jujitsu with Hickson, I mean, Hickson would say, which is my philosophy to this day, you get the takedown. If you do get the takedown, your sole objective is to clear the legs and mount. By mount, I mean front or back mount, period. You're not even staying inside control, hunting for an opportunity. You are mounting. If a golden opportunity presents itself while you're mounting, certainly take it. But your objective is to take down, clear the legs, and end up mounted. If you get taken down, your sole objective is to procure the closed guard and sweep or finish. It's not to hang out in half guard. It's to get to closed, sweep or finish. And that's the way I was raised in, in, in my jujitsu career. And it's, it's served me for my goal and my mission statement as self-defense the best. And that's what I wanted to portray in this. I didn't want anything that, that, that was fancy uh, and that defied the lead character's fighting nature. And I certainly didn't want anything that defied the time period. I wanted it to be very realistic. And look, that, that, that's nothing against, you know, look, at the end of the day, any sport guy, you know, uh, the Mayo brothers, they're still going to break a dude's arm at the Chevron station if they get attacked. It, it's like Keenan Cornelius is still going to break a dude in half if he, if, he, if he gets in an altercation at the shopping mall. It, it's not saying the other, otherwise. It's just for my kid on a playground, I don't want at any point him to be able to take a punch to the face at any point. And that's just my mission statement. And I wanted that to be represented accurately in the film. Yeah, well, and you're also, like you said, you're being true to the times. Like, you know, if as a jiu-jitsu practitioner, you know, who's been around for a while, if I would have, like, watched it and then, you know, in that fight scene where it's, you know, it's 90, it's in the early 90s or whatever, and all of a sudden the dude, like, inverts upside down or some crazy thing, I, I would watch and say, well, this is, what is this? You mm-hmm. know, because, again, that's the thing that oftentimes isn't really fun about watching it is because it's almost like a, I'm a history geek. And so I'll watch a movie that's based on a historical thing. And I'm like, that, that didn't happen. Like, why did they, why did they ruin it? Because it, it, the, the history was super interesting and fascinating. Why did they ruin it? And a lot of times with fighting, like, again, it, I feel like sometimes it gets ruined, especially when they involve jujitsu. So I thought you did a good job. I, and I'm, by, by the way, I'm curious, you said something about a book. What was the name of your book? And what was that about? I, I don't know about it. Uh, it's a book. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I, I've written 
uh, I've been published in a number of different magazines coming up a, a, as an actor and mm -hmm. a, being a writer. And uh, one time there was a magazine in the late 90s called Jane Magazine. The editor is Jane Pratt. It's like Cosmopolitan whatnot. She contacted me. She asked me to write a piece for a magazine. And I politely said, I have no idea what I could possibly lend to a woman's magazine. You know, it seems like the articles are on application of makeup and lipstick and whatnot. She said, you know, why don't you write about your first kiss? She wrote, she read something and I wrote for, wrote for details or detour or one of those. And I, I've always converted everything into a story. Mm -hmm. I even did a road test, uh, uh, driving cars and I turned it into a story. She read some pieces that I wrote. She wrote, love them. She goes, why don't you write about your first kiss? I said, oddly enough, the first girl that ever punctuated my consciousness was when I was eight years old and she grew up on the other side of my fence. I said, you know what? I'll write this. I've always wanted to write this as a novel. Um, but I will write this as a short story for your magazine. Well, I did in 98 and it came out and a lot of people tried to option the rights to it and whatnot. And I did, it was a very, very personal story to me. So I didn't really want to sell it. Uh, and so I sat on it for a number of years. And then a handful of years ago, I decided to, again, just like my jujitsu career, I kind of took a year off and wrote that as, as a, 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 a literary piece to, to eventually just, get it out on my, on my blog website. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of people read it, friends of mine, they said, man, you got to have this traditionally published. It's that good, what not. I said, man, I don't have the first clue as to how one, one, one person said, uh, I know what agent, would you mind if I sent it to her? The next thing you know, Hachette, the biggest publisher on the planet, wants to publish the book. So that's how it happened. And, uh, and, and it came out and it was embraced very, very flatteringly. And uh, it's called Jane Two. And it's, uh, again, it's, it's like the, uh, it's one of those things on my head. I could hand that to my kids and say, a lot of what I would want you to learn is inside this book. Mm. Um, and, uh, the two, it's not a part two, it's Jane and then TWO. And that's uh, about a girl that I knew and her parents were hippies and they numbered their kids. So I always used to hear them call them in. She'd be one, three, two supper. And so I knew her <laughs> as Jane too. Oh, and it's wow. about uh, my experiences growing up in Texas with this girl on the other side of a fence. Oh, cool. So it's kind of like a, kind of a bit of a memoir. It is, but, but I did, uh, uh, you know, you have an option of what, what kind of book you're going to write. I did yeah. put novel at the bottom uh, just so uh, some people wouldn't set my house on fire. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to read it and make sure why that would be the case. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sean, you know, you talk about your kids being in the movie. Um, I've got two kids, five and three. And, uh, you know, every, every person that falls in love with jujitsu wants their kids to fall in love with jujitsu because you see the value of it. Right. Um, I kind of, as a younger kid, I didn't, I was very afraid of altercations, very afraid of, you know, I played sports, but I never really got into fights and stuff. And having that kind of knowledge and that confidence in yourself, I think is very important you know, for numerous reasons, but for you, how important was it to get your kids into jujitsu? And how did you do that in a way that was really, that they took to it and they really enjoyed it? Now it's something you guys do together. Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll probably piss off a handful of parents out here right now, but I'll tell you the truth is somewhere along the line in our culture, we, we stopped caring about the body. I mean, right now you have parents that are so proud of their kids for having straight A's and their kids are morbidly obese. Yeah. I, 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 I just find that to be a huge lack of parenting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it exactly what it is. Um, somewhere along the line, we thought, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's imperative that my kid goes to school and they learn math and they learn reading and writing. But nobody ever addresses, do we have to keep this physically fit? Mm -hmm. For me, in my household, Self-defense is a life skill. There is no way in hell I would ever put a child out in the world that can't swim. I would be an irresponsible parent. And yet you meet some adults that can't swim. I don't know how that happened. Did you learn reading and writing and math? Why? Why did your parents think it was okay to learn how to balance a checkbook, but not potentially save your life should you fall off a boat? I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. So swimming, it's not an elective in my house. You're going to learn how to swim. Not only that, you're going to learn how to save someone else should they start drowning. You're going to have that level of command over water. You don't have to be on a swim team and race for medals and ribbons, but you have to learn water safety to the level that if your little brother gets in trouble, you can 
take him out of the water. You have that good a command of the water. Same thing with self-defense. There's no way I'm ever going to put a kid out into the world when he goes to the prom and he's 16 and another dude grabs his chick's ass and he has to go here. That's my self-defense curriculum. I hope you don't do it again. When some, when my son knocks on a door and a dad says, yes, honey, and lets his 16 year old daughter go with my son, that man's going to know your daughter's in good hands. That boy has the ability to protect the daughter. There's no way in hell that I would rely on hope for my son's will to not get bent so repetitively, repetitively, it ends up broken. I find that to be irresponsible parenting. It's not an option. You don't have to do tournaments, but you're going to learn self-defense and you're going to learn swimming. Now, in the process of that, my boys have fallen in love with it. They want to do tournaments. They want, they're lo they love it. It's, it's what we do on the mat. It's, 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 it's our dad time. But that kind of happened organically. And I think they see my love for it. And also, a lot of their friends do jujitsu. And so it's, it's, their, it's their common area. But it's never a discussion to me. I have parents all the time that come and they say, you know what? Uh, we were thinking about either, either jujitsu or baseball. I'm like, well, that's, that's the difference between you know, eating a protein rich meal or digesting some sand. I, I, I don't understand the, the, the one is necessary for life. There is never as much as base. People may love baseball. There's no problem that's going to be solved on first base. There's no problem that's going to be solved on the pitcher's mound. But I promise you, eventually, there's going to be plenty of problems in every young man's life that will be solved by what you do on that red mat. Everyone. Every kid that comes out of a womb will benefit in life eventually from what we teach on that red map. And to me in my household, it's not an option. Yeah, I was speaking to a woman just the, like like two days ago. Um, I was in line at the coffee shop and I just, you know, sometimes I'll just buy people coffee. I'm like, hey, I'll, I'll get whatever she's getting. And we started chatting for a few minutes and she said, like, she saw my shirt had jujitsu on it. And she said, oh, you do jujitsu? I was like, yeah. So she was telling me about her son who's like seven years old or something and uh, he's getting picked on. And she's like, well, what do you think I should do with him? Like, because she said, like, I, you know, I told him to talk to the teacher or, you know, talk to the adult or something like that. I was like, you got to teach him how to fight back, you know? And then she looked at me like, y y really? You think so? Like the idea of like fighting back has become such a, a bad thing. I'm like, no, you have to, because I told her for me, I was like, I got bullied. I was like, and as soon as I learned how to use like a wrestling double leg to like take my bullies down and pound them, I was like, they stopped messing with me. And then I didn't have to go in any, I could go in whatever direction I wanted to go because I didn't feel like I had to fit in anywhere because I felt self-reliant. And so I think you're right. It's something where we've gotten away from in our culture where, like I said, we're all in the head, good grades, good, this, good, that, but it's like, you need to, like you said, be physically able, both like, you know, as far as your health and everything else, but also you need to have those basic skills to defend yourself. Because again, you know, when you get out there outside, when you're away from your parents, stuff's going to happen and you need to know that you, you can take care of yourself. Absolutely. You know, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, a lot of academies, they, they teach the kids the three T's, you know, the, the tell them, tattle, and then tackle. Mm -hmm. yep. And it, it, it's, it's, we do a variation of the same thing, but we, we, we add a little bit to it. When you tell them, you know, the first thing that you do, you're going to take your finger and you're going to put it about two inches from the nose. You can say, knock it off. I don't want you to do that. Knock it off. The second time you tell you tattle, but you tell them you're going to tattle. You're going to say, I told you once right now, I'm going to go tell Miss Smith, you can come with me or not. I'm not going to do it behind your back. You can watch me do it. I'm going to go tell Miss Smith because I don't want it to go on. You want to come with me? I'm not doing it behind your back. Watch me. Hey, Miss Smith, I told him once he kept doing it. Now, then the third time, all bets are off. You don't let somebody come inside that space bubble. You understand what the red zone and the green zone is, mm. but you have to do it in the right way. The whole tell them and then tattle behind their back, then you're, then you're a pussy. Oh, well, so-and-so went and told Miss Smith. No, you tell them, I'm going to tell Miss Smith. You can come with me or not, but I'm telling you right now, I'm going to walk over there. I'm going to tell you you're doing this. And that's a very different way of diffusing bullying than simply going and telling the teacher. I mean, some, some of the parents don't understand what it's going to do if you run to a teacher behind a bully's back. You're going to get your ass kicked even more if that happens. You have to understand the dynamic nature of why people pick on people and how to diffuse that mechanically in the same way that we diffuse an aggressor with mechanical advantage in jujitsu. 
So, I mean, all the kids know exactly how to do it, as well as stupid things. In any, you know, we talk with our hands. Our hands are always up here. One of the things we do is we always scratch our ear. And we're talking like this. Where are my hands? My hands are right here. That's how close they are. Yeah, yeah. So we scratch our ear and we're talking like just simple, stupid things that the vast majority of the people have no idea of, no idea, and that are vitally important. And I'm sure you teach your kids class the same exact way because you're a like-minded individual. But I never want one of my kids, one of my students, to go into a situation ill-propelled, ill-prepared, and not have a game plan of exactly how to execute with an aggressor in step-by-step format. So they're not going, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And we even drill it. We even drill their voice and how to speak and how to point Mm -hmm. and where the hands go, everything. And you'd be blown away. The first time you get in a kid's face and you yell with your finger, it scares them. Mm -hmm. It scares the shit out of them. But they go, oh, okay, wow. That's a tool. That, that you, some kids cry. The first time you go, knock it off. And they go, oh. <laughs> and you're, just, you're, you're just their coach. But it's yeah. vitally important that they see the power of just a gesture of body language. And they go, okay, wow. Another thing we do on my map, everything that we start, we use the word fight. We never start calisthenics. We're like, okay, you know, we have the five fundamental moves we start every class with. Ready? Fight. So they're anesthetized to that word. When somebody says, you want to fight? They hear it 75 times every class. And they think, oh, well, I do this shit five days a week. I've done it five years, five days a week. They're not afraid of this new thing called a fight. I mean, we call it what it is. We don't say, ready, go, ready, go, ready, go. And then in the hallway, they hear, you want to fight? And they're like, whoa, that's different because I do, I do something different. Mm. They hear it every day. And that's what we do on the mat. So it's not shocking to them. But in a lot of households, what I'm talking about, is like they have your kid to shoot up heroin. I mean, it's that it's it, it's it's anathema to their values. You know, teaching your kid to prepare for a physical altercation, and certainly I, I hope it never exists. But I want them to have that in their back pocket that they can pull out and go. You know what? Fuck you. That's not going to happen. And I want that ability to be more than just hope, because hope ain't going to show up. And if you turn around and you find out that even you don't have your own back, don't think anybody else is going to have your back. Mm. It's really interesting. On you know. The, the reps you're taking them through these reps you're putting you're making these unique situations you know not everybody gets in a fight every day but like these situations that arise don't seem very foreign and you already have a game plan and you're prepared so if a kid is like this happens you already know what to do you don't have to think about what i'm gonna do you already have a set rule set what you're gonna follow boom 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 and you know one two and three three means this we're gonna go and, and i it's interesting you know like the cueing like the the fight word it's not like you said it's not going to be a startling thing to hear it's very interesting for me um just because i haven't really run a lot of kids classes and stuff and just hearing that like even when i work with my kids it can be a really kind of powerful thing because you're kind of giving them a, a set game plan like a roadmap, which it's really interesting to me i i, I mean to me it, it, it is it's it's that important yeah, it really yeah. is. And what a lot of parents also don't understand is that adrenaline dump. The first time you get in a fight, you're going to be able to access about 10% of your technique, 10%. <laughs> but if you're, if you, if you're adjusted to that adrenaline dump and that emotional spike, maybe that 10 goes to 15 eventually, maybe it goes to 20. So you surprise your kids always with spontaneous high anxiety matches somebody that's oh i hate going with this guy and in front of the whole class so the class is like going, and they experience that kind of uh so they they it's not the first time when somebody steps to them there's so many things by rote memory how to point how to say what are the steps where are my hands going all of those those are so on automatic those are anesthetized to what i'm going to forget those are going to be in the 10 percent for sure mm. There's fewer things that are going to be lost in the emotional moment. And I know that going in, man, it would have made my life exponentially easier if I'd have had that in my back pocket. Holy shit. (laughs) There's nothing that would equate to that value if I had that in my back pocket growing up. Do, Do you think your movie is going to make or has it made an impact Maybe even parents might see it, you know, they may have not thought about putting their kids in jujitsu. Like, have you seen any impact from, from your film, you know, possibly getting more kids interested? Have you had messages or anything like that? 
Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I mean, even, even for here, and I have a very, you know, underground academy, for example, like, like, like the academy is on my property. So I heavily vet every potential student. I mean, you have to come recommend it only because it's on my property. It's mm -hmm. not that I think the world of myself, but if, if you're going to be, if you're going to know where my house is, you're going to have that kind of access to my family, then I need to know exactly who you are. But, you know, so a lot of people inquire and certainly probably 800% more frequently now with the movie, but I am wary of people that are a little intoxicated of the film. Mm -hmm. You know, I want people that really investigate it. They educate themselves on what it is. I don't want anybody to try it out for a month. I, I want people that are in, in for a penny and for a pound. You know, this is a lifestyle you want to adopt. So I'm a little reluctant to the people that, you know, it, it's just like, you know, you see a commercial for P90X and oh, I'm going to buy it. And it's like, mm, you know what? Think about it for eight months. If you're really, if you're really dead set on getting in shape, contacted me and I'll give you a TRX system to hang in your doorway. But everybody else is going to buy it because they see a, a fitness ad and they see somebody with an eight pack and they go, oh, I'm going to do that. And they buy it and they never use it. You know, so yes, there's been a huge increase in, in inquiry, even on social media, people that say, hey, I just signed up at X. I just, even if it's not my academy, but I'm a, I'm a little wary of how long they're going to do it because they see what is essentially an infomercial for jujitsu and they get high on it and they go and they sign their kid up. But, you know, it, it may last a month. Some of them may find something that they truly love, like I did. But I, I fear that a large per percentage of them are going to, you know, it's going to be a, a, an intoxication that wears off. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's it's something where people, a lot of times they see this stuff. Like I, I remember one of the times I um, I had a, a get together for my coaches, and we went out and got some, got a bourbon tasting, and had some food and stuff. We were just kind of all hanging out, and then we're all kind of going around and talking about the training and just the the brotherhood that existed. And the woman that was running the tasting, sitting back, looking at us, and she comes up to me. She's like, "What do you guys do?" Because everybody's speaking from from a place deep in their heart about everything and about how they feel about each other and that kind of thing. And uh, if she was to see it and experience it, probably wouldn't be the same thing. And I think a lot of times people see it, like I said might watch the movie they might watch people talk about it um and jiu-jitsu has become so mainstream now it's pop culture back in the day you had to dig to find it you know like on the back page of some website now it's it's out there um and then people get into it and it's difficult it's really difficult it's not easy um you know i'm curious because we all deal with difficulty in a different way when you were coming up um you know, like, how did you deal with the difficulty of like, again, you get into this thing, it's tough, it's, it's, it's arduous, you probably had some injuries along the way. Like, w was there ever something that maybe you kind of clung to that kind of helped you out with that kind of stuff? Man, it was truly the love of the martial art. Mm. And to see that type of, honestly, it was somebody that had a nuclear weapon in their back pocket. I was enthralled with that. And things that kept me going, I'll, I'll tell you, just the contrary, the way that I came up, and I'm sure you were, not, you were the same because of the era alone, there were more deterrents to keeping a student going. Now, yeah. there are all these incentives. I mean, now, everybody starts from their knees. I mean, starting from stand-up is like, whoa, you savages. It's just unheard of. You know what I mean? It's like, there's just a very, and I mean, this is the way jujitsu starts nowadays. <laughs> and you know it's a you know what i mean it, it, it's it's the most passive looking thing known to man it's the way i came up and again i i i, I ain't even telling the true story because it makes me sound like whoa i came up when it was really tough and hard that's not that's not it at all it just was because the way that it was taught would get your academy shut down in 2021 <laughs> i mean I, i'm not kidding when i tell i you, believe you, you yeah know, Henry Akins would mount me and slap me and not let you tap unless there was a submission, you know, and I love him to death. Two things here. I hated it at the time. And I'm telling you this with all the humility in the world. I left Hickson's Academy plenty of times with the red mist in my eyes, almost in tears that we'd, we would finish around and I'd stand up and like, <sighs> they go, Flannery, you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. But really, I was on the verge of crying because maybe once I was I was panicking and claustrophobic and and I and, and because you know when you're early white belt you would tap and they'd laugh at you and wouldn't let you out so I was so.
petrified of getting mounted. Mm. And it, so at times you just hope a submission comes so you can get out and then they wouldn't submit you. And I am so grateful to go through that tunnel and now know I can find comfort in the most overwhelming pile of discomfort known to man, but only because I was thrown into that dark place. Mm. And I'm so grateful for having come out the other end. But in, 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 in direct contrast to what you asked, holy, is there anything that kept me going? As a matter of fact, there are a lot of things that forced me to want to stop. And I saw so many people leave because they're like, fuck this, man, I don't need this shit. Mm -hmm. And they weren't wrong, brother. They weren't wrong. I mean, I left every day, every night at Hickson's Academy with ghee burn everywhere. I mean, it was back when, when you're, you're leaning on the face and you're helping you have to bridge and use your hips to unbase them when they're mounted. So they're not leaning an elbow in your eye socket. And again, I'm not saying it to say, I came up really tough and hard, but man, the, 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 the lessons you learn from being put in those horrible positions are priceless in my opinion. And, and I'm very glad because there were plenty of times that like an infant, I thought about quitting and I wanted to. And I don't say it from a macho place because I was on the verge of tears as a grown man. And there are plenty of times that after class, I went and I sat in my car and I just <sighs> <sighs> had to get it out, man. It, it, it's, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was brutal to say the least. And, and I, I came cl very close to being broken so many times at that academy that in hindsight, I'm very, very grateful for, very grateful for. Do you think, cause you know, you're an actor and obviously you've been in some, some movies that, you know, if you say the names of them, people are going to know what those movies are. Right. Like, um, and something that I always think about is like, like actors and, and you guys that, that get into this stuff, it's probably something that has to be hard to wrap your head around sometimes like that. So many people know you, so many people think you're cool. Hey, autographs, whatever. Do you think jujitsu is helpful? Because I mean, I see actors getting into it um, more often now, but then like, there's also some that don't roll uh, or that they roll with very selective people. Like you were out there training, like getting down with it, right? Like just doing the damn thing. Do you think it helped you like sort of keep yourself sort of steady, like sort of like as far as the ego goes, where you're keeping things level, where like you have these two contrasting things where, yeah, you're this big shot over here, but over here, you're still having the, that, you know, daily slice of humble pie served to you. No, to be honest, I've never been a marquee player. I've never been a guy that could walk into academy and guys like, oh my God, it's the, it's never been like that. I mean, okay. occasionally guys would be like, man, did anybody ever tell you you look like the guy from, but it's been like that. Ah, uh, okay. Like, should, you know what I mean? So, you know, I'd love to tell you that I'm such a, such a grounded person. I'm as famous as Brad Pitt and I still win in a row. I, I, I've never been like that. So it's been gotcha. easy for me. I could walk into mm -hmm. any academy and by the time we've rolled five times, then a guy gets when, no shit. That's the dude from Boondock set? No, fucking hell. <laughs> but by then it's too late. We've already rolled five times. So you, you're not, you're not starstruck anymore. You're like, motherfucker, that, that, I just joked him <laughs> and then he fucking triangled me. He had my, he had his balls in my face. It's like, uh. I don't need the, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, I, I, but, but, but to me, the, the magic of this martial art is really, and if I ever get to Kentucky, we're going to roll. We're both going to roll. That's going to happen a hundred percent. The magic of it is you're going to clap hands and the truth is going to be exposed. The magic is I don't know you. I've met you on a Zoom call. I don't know if you're going to let go of an arm if you get it. You don't know if I'm going to, if I get it. But there's a connection within this martial art that makes us have a completely different relationship out of the gate. But every single day you get to accurately measure yourself. The one thing that separates this martial art from all others is it's not theory. We're not doing a kata and saying, we think that if this happened, this is how it would, def it's not that, it's not theory. We actually test it. At the end of the class, we go, rip, yep, go, and we, we go. And we find out if the shit works in real time against 100% duress and stress. And that's the differentiating factor. If you don't do that, if you get your belt through privates, I don't know. I don't believe in that crap. I think it's absolute garbage. And I think you're denying yourself the beautiful aspects of this martial art where you test it against someone that is trying to break you. He's trying to collapse your carotid artery and put you to sleep, or he's trying to hyperextend your elbow. And we all rely on a tiny little flutter of the hand 
that we will all obey instantaneously. Quicker than your mom could say, clean your room. They take you a, a minute. But man, if your training partner does, your, your immediate release. And that is something that unless you've been on the receiving end of a shattered shoulder and ask just a brief, and it's released immediately, you don't understand the repercussions of that test that, that comes up across daily. Whatever you learned, you're going to find out in real time, can I apply this? And that's how you hone those skills. No matter how much technique and how much drilling you do, until you have another man diving on you, throwing haymakers and trying to smash his elbow in your face, do you understand, can I maintain the distance? Can I apply an arm lock while a guy is trying to lean on me? Yes or no? That's the proving ground. So I, I, I don't, I mean, I hear about people that have received belts through, through private lessons, but I don't know any. And, mm. and, and if they do, man, how, how, what, what a cheat. You're cheating yourself out of some of the most glorious aspects of this martial art. How is, um, you know, you've been, how long have you been a black belt, Sean? May 4th of 08. Okay. So, and, and, so and, and, and like you too, I'm sure you know it ingrained in your psyche. I can tell you what the weather was like. I can tell you uh, there was chlorophyll in the air. Somebody had mowed the lawn right across the street. I can tell you that they were cooking burritos next door. Yeah. I, I can tell you everything of that day, May 4th of 08. That's oh, how yeah. long. So yeah, so, you're talking th 13 years. Yeah. So you've been, you've been doing jujitsu for quite a while now, you know, you're, you're, you're how is, how has your jujitsu training evolved? How's it changed as you've gotten older? Has your, has your body's kind of aged a little bit? Like, how have you kept your body healthy and, and how is your training now? How intense do you go and how do you keep yourself together and, and keep training at high level? Well, you know, I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I had, uh, because I value rolling, so it, 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 it's at the top, top of the ladder. I need that for ego reasons. I need it for cardio reasons. I need it to, to at finish my day going, <sighs> I need to take a ringing wet gi and put it on the laundry pile. That's part of my therapy. If I, if I, if I finish class and I take a dry gi, I feel <sighs> I didn't really, uh, it's just a part of me that I, I didn't leave enough on the mat. So none of that has changed. I mean, I have guys out there that try and kill me every single day. And my goal is to have every student finish me, as is yours, too. If, if that's not your goal, I think you're a shitty instructor. Now, part of me will die every time one of my students does that. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. They get, but, you know, you're like, damn, man. But that is your goal. But absolutely, every day. And I'm sure you know, especially, you know, with lower belts, when I roll, to get a good roll, I'll hold tennis balls. So I cannot make grips. So I'll handicap myself so I can get a killer roll with a purple belt where you're, it, it's an even match when you're holding tennis balls and you're trying to work for your closed guard and then get top position. You can't use any grips, gi or no gi. You know, so I'll handicap myself as far as like making the training go well. But, you know, I certainly, where I think age has, has, has I, I really feel age is the multiple times a day. I, now, I have, I have one good session a day. Gone are those days where I could do five hours a day. And in injuries don't heal nearly as quickly, but I've had both meniscuses done. So for, for example, everything sumagayashi, anytime butterfly hook sweeps, I have a, t a smaller window of the angle of my knee where I can apply that. So I have things that I steer away from. I keep it in the curriculum for my students, but some things that I know Mm, I, I need to worry about my back in this position. But like anybody else, it, 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 that, that was when I was 30. You always had things that you steer around, mm -hmm. but it doesn't affect your game. You just make, you put a Band-Aid on that and you look elsewhere. You start to refine other areas of your game so you can try to stay away from that and only use it when you absolutely need to. But it really hasn't changed. I mean, I... I train and, and, and that's a part of what keeps me healthy and keeps me loving this. I mean, although, you know, the first half of my career was compete, 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 compete. If somebody said, oh, Flannery, man, show me that arm lock you hit on me. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, after class I will. Man, I'm fucking after class, I was out the door. I didn't give a shit. I wasn't going to give anybody anything. It was, it was a very selfish thing. Now, as a, an instructor, it's this, you know, it's this. But even having said that, where I get that competitive fulfillment is on the mat, an open mat. And trust me, I, I don't care how good you are. If you go five straight five minute rounds, 
and take a fresh blue belt, you got your hands full. Mm -hmm. You've got your hands full. I don't care how good you are. You, there is a cardio level to where a, a strong ass D1 wrestling white belt will give you a stalemate. Oh yeah. And, and if you don't agree with me, you haven't been cardio taxed enough because mm -hmm. you know, everybody, no matter what kind of belt level you have on your mat, you can use them as a training tool to not only get better, but get a cardiovascular workout as well. You just have to tax yourself and put yourself in that area. <laughs> Sean, just to end it, like what, what's your, what's your uh, future look like as far as acting? Is there anything you want to do like follow up as far as this movie, how it went? Is there anything you want to do in, in conjunction with jujitsu down the line or any other movies you're kind of interested in doing? I'm just curious. Uh, you know, at this point in my career, you know, I, I, I really, I like staying home. Um, you know, I don't want to travel the world and do mm -hmm. movies. I have a family, you know, it, that, that uh, you know, my wife and my kids are the, not, not just my main uh, priority. They're really my only priority. And uh, having said that, you know, I, I, I'm still an actor. That's my bread and butter, but I definitely want to transition into more writing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's a, uh, you know, one of, one of the, the most wonderful moments of my acting career is writing this and seeing it through to completion mm -hmm. and being creatively involved in every decision-making process to where it turned out to where I could turn out a product that I truly believe in and not say, you know, I wrote the script, but then they changed it, you know, the Vatican story to no hard thongs. And, yeah. you know, it, it's uh, so I definitely want to, transition a little more to that but uh jujitsu will always be a priority you know here in texas i have my academy on my property i have a a, a company called the jujitsu heirloom which uh you know we raise money we sponsor kids and we do various things like that so it's my you know i'm an old school martial artist traditional martial artist so part of me being a black belt is now giving back you know mm -hmm. it, it, the onus is on me to leave a legacy of people that i that understand what I think is a very rare form of jujitsu. So what's in my future? Absolutely more jujitsu and leaving behind a legacy of people that absolutely know concisely and clearly this specific curriculum and a lot of the elements that I think are lost. You know, a lot of one of the reasons that I think people, you know, throw away, for example, you know, fundamental jujitsu is because they don't understand it clearly. I mean, half the time when people say, well, I don't do that because this can happen. I say, well, show me. And they do it. I'm saying, well, you're missing three details. With these three details, tell me if you still believe that could happen. They, oh, oh, okay, damn. Well, no, wow. I can't believe I, nobody ever showed me. It's, you know, so, so to me, I want to leave a legacy with that specificity behind. You know, I truly believe that, uh, you know, it's going to come back to a jab and a cross like boxing, mm. you know, and, and people aren't going to start learning a spinning back fist. I think people are going to eventually go, you know what, maybe I should start learning a jab. And uh, if they spend enough time to learn it, they're, they're, the, the, the large preponderance of their time are going to be spent on that jab and cross. Mm. Awesome. Brother, appreciate you being on with us, man. I had a blast talking with you. Yeah. Um, and again, thank you for putting on the movie. If someone wants to, um, one, if someone wants to, to watch the movie, where's the, I don't know if there's a best place for them to, uh, to rent it or buy it or whatever. Uh, and then if people are interested in following your sort of seeing what you're up to, where's the best place to do that as well? Um, as far as the film goes, you know, you can rent it uh, on all the, you know, iTunes, Amazon yeah. Prime or w w on demand. Yeah. I, um, I snagged it off YouTube, but I didn't know if there was like a best place for it. Yeah. I did Amazon. yeah you, you, you can buy it off YouTube as well. Um, there's not a best place. It's, okay. it's, it's a, whatever you have access to. And, and, you know, I, I'm flattered I, for the more people that can watch it, the better. I mean, I, I, I love hearing feedback. So if people do watch it, please reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is SP Flannery. Uh, and, you know, so many people reach out and they go, well, you know, is this Sean's handler? It's like, motherfucker, I, I don't know. Handler. <laughs> I mean, it, it ain't like I'm Brad Pitt. You know what I mean? I got, I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I understand that I'm like a, a CD level celebrity. It's I, I, you know, and, and and one of the wonderful things about that is I, I have I have such a limited amount of interaction. I can interact with every single person. Mm -hmm. So if they do watch the movie, please reach out and let me know your thoughts on it. Um, if anybody is in the area and wants to drop into my academy, you know, we do a little bit of vetting. But if you have any students, reach out and say, hey, my buddy Mike is going to be there. Door is wide open, man. If anybody does watch the movie, please reach out. 
And uh, all the social medias are mine. Sean Patrick Flannery. I have a fan page on Facebook as well as my private page. Sean Patrick Flannery. It's operated by me. If anybody responds with that handle, it's me. Um, there are fake profiles out there. You know, the real Sean Flannery. There's no real. It's my name. And the Instagram is SP Flannery at SP Flannery. So, uh, yeah, uh, stay in touch. Reach out. The, the Jiu-Jitsu Academy website is HollywoodBJJHouston.com. Um, and uh, that's a very large portion of my life. Thank you um, again. And and thanks for sharing, spending some time with us. It, uh, I, I really feel like you're a humble, you seem like a very humble down to earth person. And uh, I'm glad that you're, you know, one of the actors that's, you know, kind of showing what jujitsu is to, to people. I think it's awesome. Well, I'm flattered brother. And uh, you know, although we've never met you, I've seen a multitude of your videos and they're spot the fuck on. And they're great and they're engaging. So you got a good thing going there. Keep it going. Uh, keep keep spreading the love. And uh, thank you guys for the time. And again, anytime you guys are in the Houston area, reach out or if you have any students, please give me a screen. I'll definitely do so, that, brother. Thank you, man. Thanks for being appreciate on the show. You. Thank you. Take care, y'all. All right, bye-bye. Later, brother. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Again, as we talked about in the the, the opening, you know, the passion that that dude has for jiu-jitsu was very apparent. And again, for me, I'm, I'm – uh, because there are those people that get like the private black belts, you know, mm. there's people where I've, I've heard stories of people where affluent people or people in like certain like, you know, Hollywood and stuff have like, just, you know, here, give me my belt, you know. And so I have respect for people that do it, that that actually like do it, do it, that endure the same thing like the rest of us. You yeah. know, I just have a certain respect for people that are willing to go through that. And uh, so I had a lot of fun uh, talking with them. Uh, guys, also, if you want to hear Sean talk about uh, some of his opinions about like martial arts and movies and stuff, because yeah. obviously he's a lifelong martial artist, probably see some things in, in movies that maybe y just like you, you might kind of look at and go, ugh. Yep. So we kind of talked to him about that. And that'll be in the Patreon. If you guys want to check that, that out, you can go to the Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash the Jiu Jitsu podcast. And um, along with that one, obviously, we've got pretty much every guest we've ever had. We have a little conversation with them about something uh, that we find entertaining. Along with that, there's there's an, like there's a weightlifting or weight like a, a really basic one for beginners like weight training ebook there's videos for uh, technical stuff there's full rolling stuff that in the back there uh, i think we've got a breathing video in there somewhere there's a warm up video i mean there's there's so much content that thing's just piling up um, but again lots of cool stuff and again i'm um i'm doing it's not I'm so, the traveling's been really weird with it, mm -hmm. um, but I do a Zoom call with people inside the uh, my vault membership and with the the Jujitsu Patreons. Yes, uh, for the the second tier, and I do a, a Zoom call with them and hang out live. Uh, you know where we basically just chat. Usually it's on Sundays, but I'm still trying to play around with other days that I can mix that up to. And if you guys want to check that out, you can go on over there to do that. And again, big thanks to our sponsor, Charlotte's Web. Again, if you want to check out some of their stuff, try it out to see if you get the same benefits that a lot of us have had, like a lot of my students have had, and like a lot of the people who message me. It's becoming more of a common occurrence. It used to be every now and then I'd get a message. Now it's becoming like, hey, I tried that, the sleep gummies out, or I tried this out, or I tried that out, and I really like it. If you want to see, uh, see what people are talking about, see if it does the same effect to you. Because again, I just want to be upfront with you. Not everybody gets the same effect. Everybody's a little different. Some people see, uh, you know, a myriad of different benefits. Some people say, you know what, I didn't really get anything from mm -hmm. it. Try it out for yourself. See what you think. You can go to charlottesweb.com. Use the promo code Jujitsu. Save fifteen percent on the order. And again, if you're in the uh, the neighborhood or in the uh, not the neighborhood, that doesn't make sense. If you're on the hunt, in the what, what was I going to say? If you're in the I don't know. If you're on the hunt for some jiu-jitsu gear that's very clean looking, simple, affordable, all that stuff, and you're just kind of wanting to uh, to get some more jiu-jitsu gear, you can go over to epicrollbjj.com and you can check out his stuff. Again, whatever you buy, use the promo code jiu-jitsu. Helps us out. Saves you a little bit of money. It's a win-win. And again, if you want to get a, a hold of some, some nice man care products, you can go to manscaped.com. Use the promo code Jiu-Jitsu 20, you'll save 20% on the order, and you get free shipping. And we got Submission Nutrition. You can go to their website, submissionnutrition.com. If you didn't, if you missed the first thing, just check his stuff out. Uh, he's got a bunch of, uh, at, the, at the current time, he's got a bunch of overnight oat, oats products uh, for people that, you know, need help just eating a decent meal for breakfast, or maybe you want to slam some some food in before training, you know, something that's a little bit not not too heavy. You can go to his website, submissionnutrition.com. Promo code is Jiu-Jitsu. And, um, 
15 percent off 15 percent off i'm just going through these going. yeah and guys again if you uh if you ever want to uh see what's going on in my world on a regular basis uh join the uh the chew crew newsletter it's uh my daily email that goes out in the typically in the morning sometimes in the evenings depending on how things are going and again along with getting the content and sort of seeing what's going on in you know the the chewsters world you also get first crack at anything that's going on any any products that i sell any events that are going on like we sold out of a seminar recently and again most of that was through the email list because those people get first dibs on everything um so those are the people so if you want to check that out and see what's going on i give a couple a uh, couple of free ebooks away you can go to jujitsu.net you'll see a little free ebook b- uh, button over there i give you an uh an ebook one is to help you out with a game plan I gave this away to my purple belts just the other day um, because I think it's useful. I think yeah. it's a really useful exercise to actually identify what it is you do, how your game connects, and understanding that even just drawing it out is very useful. I found it very useful for me. And so I give away that ebook. Um, and it even shows my exact uh, game plan that I used back in 2016, which it's not too much different. Few few extra bells and whistles, but about the same thing. I also give away an ebook on drilling. And it gives you some ideas on how you can drill both if you've got an open mat, but also if you don't have the ability to control your training, how you can do it in an active version when you're rolling. Uh, you can check that out at, again, jujitsu.net. Click on the free ebook button and you'll, uh, you'll get it. And uh, guys, I think that's it. I think we've uh, we've wrapped up all that stuff. We've said all the stuff we need to say. We had a good podcast today, in spite of resistance. Right. Um, it, it's uh, have you ever have you ever read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? No. So there's a part in that book where. He says, uh, he's talking about this, this, this form, this, um, what's the word? This, uh, this force in the universe that he calls resistance. So basically whenever you're getting ready to do something big or something you like, or you're getting ready to change things, it's like resistance pops up. You know, sometimes it can be in the form of people that try to like, you're trying to do something good for yourself and they try to pull you back down. Sometimes it's in the form of just random occurrences. You know, where I remember when I, when I used to do the videos, um, I remember it would, or when I, I used to, I still do the videos, but I remember when I first started doing the videos and it was a little bit more difficult for me, like the ambulance would go by and it would like throw me off or like people would knock on the door. I'm like, it's, it's eight 30 at night. Why are you here? Like we're closed, you know, different stuff like that. And, uh, you know, again, you have to like push through it. And so it never fails. We were like, Oh, we're super pumped about how having, uh, you know, Sean on the podcast. And I know that like all of us had, you know, a lot of people in the gym too have watched, you know, like the you know, boondock saints and everything else. Sure. So we're like super pumped about it. And then, you know, resistance pops yeah. up. And so for all of you guys, just sort of an ending thing here for you, uh, if you stuck around to the end, which I know a lot of you guys do, which I appreciate. Whenever you get ready to do something, I really like, first off, it's a good book. Check it out. War of Art. It's a great book. It's a short read. You'll read it in probably a couple hours. But the... Um, but one of the most important things I took away from it was resistance and understanding it. So like every time like I'm getting ready to do something that's kind of difficult, you know, uh, sometimes I'll even be the culprit of creating it where I want to like arrange things or something, clean things up. It's like, no, no, I need to do the work. Not, I don't need to rearrange my desk. I need to do the work, you know, but understanding and re- sort of recognizing the mm-hmm. resistance and just pushing through it because uh, it'll try to put you back into your place. So a useful idea. And I felt like we just kind of, we just experienced something. So, you know, kind of bring it to light for you guys as well. Yeah, push through it too, which was nice. Which was nice we e- Eugene's together. E- Eugene's frustrated. He's like No, no, I'm actually like, you know, uh, <laughs> here's here's where it comes for me. For me it, it's pretty simple. It's um I, I have to look at the situation. I have to say, is there anything that I could have done differently? And in my opinion, no. And if that's the case, then I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. I, it just is what it is. It was meant to be. This is the way it meant to go. Right. Um, it feels like something like I'm hard on myself if it's something yeah, you're just hard I, on like, I could have done different, yeah, right? Yeah. I, I beat myself up over that. But like for this, you know, when I know like I, I've dotted my I's, crossed my T's, mm-hmm. I've done everything I can in my power. I, I consider you you had a, a, an analogy you kind of talked about. I talk about gravity, gravity issue. It's a mm-hmm. gravity thing. I can't stop gravity. Gravity's going to continue to pull down. I can't control gravity. It's just something that's there. And so as long as I do everything in my power to, you know, make sure everything is, is going to go as cleanly as and as properly as possible. That's kind of, that's where I do it. And I'm good. Yeah. I wash my hands with it. I'm yeah. good. Well, you know, gravity doesn't exist. The earth's flat. Okay. Well, yeah, I yeah. tried to have a beautiful point here. Just I tried you, to say something. let you know, bro. 
Stop. People are going to think you're serious. I'm not. I'm not even serious a little bit. Just, you are. I'm, I'm I very, believe you. I'm very not serious. You are my coach. I believe everything you say. Yeah, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Why? <laughs> I don't know. All right, All right guys. guys. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.